Chapter 9 Here is how Billy Pilgrim lost his wife, Valencia. He was unconscious in the hospital in Vermont, after the airplane crashed on Sugarbush Mountain, and Valencia, having heard about the crash, was driving from Ilium to the hospital in the family Cadillac Eldorado Coupe de Ville. Valencia was hysterical, because she had been told, frankly, that Billy might die, or that, if he lived, he might be a vegetable. Valencia adored Billy. She was crying and yelping so hard as she drove that she missed the correct turnoff from the throughway. She applied her power brakes, and a Mercedes slammed into her from behind. Nobody was hurt, thank God, because both drivers were wearing seatbelts. Thank God, thank God. The Mercedes lost only a headlight, but the rear end of the Cadillac was a body and fender man's wet dream. The trunk and fenders were collapsed. The gaping trunk looked like the mouth of a village idiot who was explaining that he didn't know anything about anything. The fenders shrugged. The bumper was at high port arms. Reagan for president, a sticker on the bumper said. The back window was veined with cracks. The exhaust system rested on the pavement. The driver of the Mercedes got out and went to Valencia to find out if she was all right. She blabbed hysterically about Billy in the airplane crash, and then she put her car in gear and crossed the median divider, leaving her exhaust system behind. When she arrived at the hospital, people rushed to the windows to see what the noise was. The Cadillac, with both mufflers gone, sounded like a heavy bomber coming in on a wing and a prayer. Valencia turned off the engine, but then she slumped against the steering wheel, and the horn brayed steadily. A doctor and a nurse ran out to find out what the trouble was. Poor Valencia was unconscious, overcome by carbon monoxide. She was a heavenly azure. An hour later, she was dead. So it goes. Billy knew nothing about it. He dreamed on and traveled in time and so forth. The hospital was so crowded that Billy couldn't have a room to himself. He shared a room with a Harvard history professor named Bertram Copeland Rumford. Roomford didn't have to look at Billy, because Billy was surrounded by white linen screens on rubber wheels. But Roomford could hear Billy talking to himself from time to time. Roomford's left leg was in traction. He had broken it while skiing. He was seventy years old, but had the body and spirit of a man half that age. He had been honeymooning with his fifth wife when he broke his leg. Her name was Lily. Lily was twenty-three. Just about the time that poor Valencia was pronounced dead, Lily came into Billy's and Roomford's room with an armload of books. Roomford had sent her down to Boston to get them. He was working on a one-volume history of the United States Army Air Corps in World War II. The books were about bombings and sky battles that had happened before Lily was even born. "'You guys go on without me,' Billy Pilgrim said deliriously as a pretty little Lily came in. She had been a go-go girl when Roomford saw her and resolved to make her his own. She was a high school dropout. Her IQ was 103. He scares me, she whispered to her husband about Billy Pilgrim. He bores the hell out of me, Roomford replied boomingly. All he does in his sleep is quit and surrender and apologize and ask to be left alone. Roomford was a retired brigadier general in the Air Force Reserve, the official Air Force historian, a full professor, the author of 26 books, a multimillionaire since birth, and one of the great competitive sailors of all time. His most popular book was about sex and strenuous athletics for men over 65. Now he quoted Theodore Roosevelt, whom he resembled a lot. I could carve a better man out of a banana. One of the things Rumford had told Lily to get in Boston was a copy of President Harry S. Truman's announcement to the world that an atomic bomb had been dropped on Hiroshima. She had a Xerox of it, and Rumford asked her if she had read it. No. She didn't read well, which was one of the reasons she had dropped out of high school. Rumford ordered her to sit down and read the Truman Statement now. He didn't know that she couldn't read much. He knew very little about her, except that she was one more public demonstration that he was a superman. So Lily sat down and pretended to read the Truman thing, which went like this. Sixteen hours ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima, an important Japanese army base. That bomb had more power than 20,000 tons of TNT. 
It had more than 2,000 times the blast power of the British Grand Slam, which is the largest bomb ever yet used in the history of warfare. The Japanese began the war from the air at Pearl Harbor. They have been repaid manyfold, and the end is not yet. With this bomb, we have now added a new and revolutionary increase in destruction to supplement the growing power of our armed forces. In their present form, these bombs are now in production, and even more powerful forms are in development. It is an atomic bomb. It is a harnessing of the basic power of the universe. The force from which the sun draws its power has been loosed against those who brought war to the Far East. Before 1939, it was the accepted belief of scientists that it was theoretically possible to release atomic energy, but nobody knew any practical method of doing it. By 1942, however, we knew that the Germans were working feverishly to find a way to add atomic energy to all the other engines of war with which they had hoped to enslave the world. But they failed. We may be grateful to Providence that the Germans got the V1s and V2s late and in limited qualities, and even more grateful that they did not get the atomic bomb at all. The battle of the laboratories held fateful risks for us as well as the battles of the air, land, and sea, and we have now won the battle of the laboratories as we have won the other battles. We are now prepared to obliterate more rapidly and completely every productive enterprise the Japanese have above ground in any city, said Harry Truman. We shall destroy their docks, their factories, and their communications. Let there be no mistake. We shall completely destroy Japan's power to make war. It was to spare, and so on. One of the books that Lily had brought room for was The Destruction of Dresden by an Englishman named David Irving. It was an American edition published by Holt, Reinhardt, and Winston in 1964. What Rumford wanted from it were portions of the forewords by his friends Ira C. Eaker, Lieutenant General USAF, retired, and British Air Marshal Sir Robert Soundby, KCB, KBE, MC, DFC, AFC. I find it difficult to understand Englishmen or Americans who weep about enemy civilians who were killed, but who have not shed a tear for our gallant crews lost in combat with a cruel enemy, wrote his friend General Eaker in part. I think it would have been well for Mr. Irving to have remembered, when he was drawing the frightful picture of the civilians killed at Dresden, that V1s and V2s were at the very same time falling on England, killing civilian men, women, and children indiscriminately, as they were designed and launched to do. It might be well to remember Buchenwald and Coventry, too. Eker's foreword ended this way. I deeply regret that British and U.S. bombers killed 135,000 people in the attack on Dresden, but I remember who started the last war, and I regret even more the loss of more than 5 million Allied lives in the necessary effort to completely defeat and utterly destroy Nazism. So it goes. What Air Marshal Sondi said, among other things, was this. That the bombing of Dresden was a great tragedy, none can deny. That it was really a military necessity, few, after reading this book, will believe. It was one of those terrible things that sometimes happen in wartime, brought about by an unfortunate combination of circumstances. Those who approved it were neither wicked nor cruel, though, they, though it may well be that they were too remote from the harsh realities of war to understand fully the appalling destructive power of air bombardment in the spring of 1945. The advocates of nuclear disarmament seemed to believe that, if they could achieve their aim, war would become tolerable and decent. They would do well to read this book and ponder the fate of Dresden, where 135,000 people died as the result of an air attack with conventional weapons. On the night of March 9, 1945, an air attack on Tokyo by American heavy bombers using incendiary and high-explosive bombs caused the death of 83,793 people. The atom bomb dropped on Hiroshima killed 71,379 people. So it goes. If you're ever in Cody, Wyoming, said Billy Pilgrim behind his white linen screens, just ask for Wild Bob. Lily Rumford shuddered, went on pretending to read the Harry Truman thing. Billy's daughter Barbara came in later that day. She was all doped up, had the same glassy-eyed look that poor old Edgar Derby wore just before he was shot in Dresden. Doctors had given her pills so she could continue to function, even though her father was broken and her mother was dead. 
so it goes. She was accompanied by a doctor and a nurse. Her brother Robert was flying home from a battlefield in Vietnam. Daddy, she said tentatively. Daddy? But Billy was ten years away, back in 1958. He was examining the eyes of a young male Mongolian idiot in order to prescribe corrective lenses. The idiot's mother was there, acting as an interpreter. How many dots do you see? Billy Pilgrim asked him. And then Billy traveled in time to when he was 16 years old, in the waiting room of a doctor. Billy had an infected thumb. There was only one other patient waiting, an old, old man. The old man was in agony because of gas. He farted tremendously, and then he belched. Excuse me, he said to Billy. Then he did it again. Oh, God, he said. I knew it was going to be bad getting old. He shook his head. I didn't know it was going to be this bad. Billy Pilgrim opened his eyes in the hospital in Vermont and did not know where he was. Watching him was his son, Robert. Robert was wearing the uniform of the famous Green Berets. Robert's hair was short, was wheat-colored bristles. Robert was clean and neat. He was decorated with a purple heart and a silver star and a bronze star with two clusters. This was a boy who had flunked out of high school, who had been an alcoholic at 16, who had run with a rotten bunch of kids, who had been arrested for tipping over hundreds of tombstones in a Catholic cemetery one time. He was all straightened out now. His posture was wonderful, and his shoes were shined, and his trousers were pressed, and he was a leader of men. Dad? Billy Pilgrim closed his eyes again. Billy had to miss his wife's funeral, because he was still so sick. He was conscious, though, while Valencia was being put into the ground in Ilium. Billy hadn't said much since regaining consciousness, hadn't responded very elaborately to the news of Valencia's death and Robert's coming home from the war and so on. It was generally believed that he was a vegetable. There was talk of performing an operation on him later, one which might improve the circulation of blood to his brain. Actually, Billy's outward listlessness was a screen. The listlessness concealed a mind which was fizzing and flashing thrillingly. It was preparing letters and lectures about the flying saucers, the negligibility of death, and the true nature of time. Professor Rumford said frightful things about Billy within Billy's hearing, confident that Billy no longer had any brain at all. Why don't they let him die? he asked Lily. I don't know, she said. That's not a human being anymore. Doctors are for human beings. They should turn him over to a veterinarian or a tree surgeon. They'd know what to do. Look at him. That's life, according to the medical profession. Isn't life wonderful? I don't know, said Lily. Rumford talked to Lily about the bombing of Dresden one time, and Billy heard it all. Rumford had a problem about Dresden. His one-volume history of the Army, Air Force, and World War II was supposed to be a readable condensation of the 27-volume Official History of the Army, Air Force, and World War II. The thing was, though, that there was almost nothing in the 27 volumes about the Dresden Raid, even though it had been such a howling success. The extent of the success had been kept a secret for many years after the war, a secret from the American people. It was no secret from the Germans, of course, or from the Russians, who occupied Dresden after the war, who were in Dresden still. "'Americans have finally heard about Dresden,' said Rumford, twenty-three years after the raid. "'A lot of them now know how much worse it was than Hiroshima, so I've got to put something about it in my book. From the official Air Force standpoint, it'll all be new.' "'Why would they keep it a secret so long?' said Lily. "'For fear that a lot of bleeding hearts—' said Rumford, might not think it was such a wonderful thing to do. It was now that Billy Pilgrim spoke up intelligently. I was there, he said. It was difficult for Rumford to take Billy seriously, since Rumford had so long considered Billy a repulsive non-person who would be much better off dead. Now, with Billy speaking clearly and to the point, Rumford's ears wanted to treat the words as a foreign language that was not worth hearing. What did he say? said Rumford. Lily had to serve as an interpreter. He said he was there, she explained. He was where? I don't know, said Lily. Where were you? she asked Billy. Dresden, said Billy. Dresden, Lily told Rumford. 
He's simply echoing things we say, said Rumford. Oh, said Lily. He's got echolalia now. Oh. Echolalia is a mental disease which makes people immediately repeat things that well people around them say. But Billy didn't really have it. Rumford simply insisted, for his own comfort, that Billy had it. Rumford was thinking in a military manner, that an inconvenient person, one whose death he wished for very much, for practical reasons, was suffering from a repulsive disease. Rumford went on insisting for several hours that Billy had echolalia, told nurses and a doctor that Billy had echolalia now. Some experiments were performed on Billy. Doctors and nurses tried to get Billy to echo something, but Billy wouldn't make a sound for them. He isn't doing it now, said Rumford peevishly. The minute you go away, he'll start doing it again. Nobody took Rumford's diagnosis seriously. The staff thought Rumford was a hateful old man, conceited and cruel. He often said to them, in one way or another, that people who were weak deserved to die, whereas the staff, of course, was devoted to the idea that weak people should be helped as much as possible, and that nobody should die. There in the hospital, Billy was having an adventure very common among people without power in time of war. He was trying to prove to a willfully deaf and blind enemy that he was interesting to hear and see. He kept silent until the lights went out at night, and then, when there had been a long period of silence containing nothing to echo, he said to Runford, I was in Dresden when it was bombed. I was a prisoner of war. Runford sighed impatiently. A word of honor, said Billy Pilgrim. Do you believe me? Must we talk about it now, said Runford. He had heard. He didn't believe. We don't ever have to talk about it, said Billy. I just want you to know I was there. Nothing more was said about Dresden that night and Billy closed his eyes, traveled in time to a May afternoon, two days after the end of the Second World War in Europe. Billy and five other American prisoners were riding in a coffin-shaped green wagon, which they had found abandoned, complete with two horses, in a suburb of Dresden. Now they were being drawn by the clop, clop, clopping horses down narrow lanes which had been cleared through the moonlike ruins. They were going back to the slaughterhouse for souvenirs of the war, Billy was reminded of the sounds of milkmen's horses early in the morning in Ilium when he was a boy. Billy sat in the back of the jiggling coffin. His head was tilted back and his nostrils were flaring. He was happy. He was warm. There was food in the wagon and wine and a camera and a stamp collection and a stuffed owl and a mantle clock that ran on changes of barometric pressure. The Americans had gone into empty houses in the suburb where they had been imprisoned, and they had taken these and many other things. The owners, hearing that the Russians were coming, killing and robbing and raping and burning, had fled. But the Russians hadn't come yet, even two days after the war. It was peaceful in the ruins. Billy saw only one other person on the way to the slaughterhouse. It was an old man pushing a baby buggy. In the buggy were pots and cups and an umbrella frame and other things he had found. Billy stayed in the wagon when it reached the slaughterhouse, sunning himself. The others went looking for souvenirs. Later on in life, the Tralfamadorians would advise Billy to concentrate on the happy moments of his life, and to ignore the unhappy ones, to stare only at pretty things as eternity failed to go by. If this sort of selectivity had been possible for Billy, he might have chosen as his happiest moment this sun-drenched snooze in the back of the wagon. Billy Pilgrim was armed as he snoozed. It was the first time he had been armed since basic training. His companions had insisted that he arm himself, since God only knew what sorts of killers might be in burrows on the face of the moon. Wild dogs, packs of rats fattened on corpses, escaped maniacs and murderers, soldiers who had never quit killing until they themselves were killed. Billy had a tremendous cavalry pistol on his belt. It was a relic of World War I. It had a ring in its butt. It was loaded with bullets the size of robin's eggs. Billy had found it on the bedside table in a house. That was one of the things about the end of the war. Absolutely anybody who wanted a weapon could have one. They were all lying around. Billy had a saber, too. It was a Luftwaffe ceremonial saber. Its hilt was stamped with a screaming eagle. The eagle was carrying a swastika and looking down. Billy found it stuck into a telephone pole. 
He had pulled it out of the pole as the wagon went by. Now his snoozing became shallower as he heard a man and a woman speaking German in pitying tones. The speakers were commiserating with somebody lyrically. Before Billy opened his eyes, it seemed to him that the tones might have been those used by friends of Jesus when they took his ruined body down from his cross. So it goes. Billy opened his eyes. A middle-aged man and wife were crooning to the horses. They were noticing what the Americans had not noticed, that the horses' mouths were bleeding, gashed by the bits, that the horses' hooves were broken so that every step meant agony, that the horses were insane with thirst. The Americans had treated their form of transportation as though it were no more sensitive than a six-cylinder Chevrolet. These two horse pitiers moved back along the wagon to where they could gaze in patronizing reproach at Billy, at Billy Pilgrim, who was so long and weak, so ridiculous in his azure toga and silver shoes. They weren't afraid of him. They weren't afraid of anything. They were doctors, both obstetricians. They had been delivering babies until the hospitals were all burned down. Now they were picnicking near where their apartment used to be. The woman was softly beautiful, translucent from having eaten potatoes for so long. The man wore a business suit, necktie and all. Potatoes had made him gaunt. He was as tall as Billy, wore steel-rimmed trifocals. This couple, so involved with babies, had never reproduced themselves, though they could have. This was an interesting comment on the whole idea of reproduction. They had nine languages between them. They tried Polish on Billy first, since he was dressed so clownishly, since the wretched Poles were the involuntary clowns of the Second World War. Billy asked them in English what it was they wanted, and they at once scolded him in English for the condition of the horses. This made Billy get out of the wagon and come look at the horses. When Billy saw the condition of his means of transportation, he burst into tears. He hadn't cried about anything else in the war. Later on, as a middle-aged optometrist, he would weep quietly and privately sometimes, but never make loud boo-hooing noises. Which is why the epigraph of this book is the quatrain from the famous Christmas carol. Billy cried very little, though he often saw things worth crying about, and in that respect, at least, he resembled the Christ of the carol. The cattle are lowing, the baby awakes, but the little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. Billy traveled in time back to the hospital in Vermont. Breakfast had been eaten and cleared away, and Professor Rumford was reluctantly becoming interested in Billy as a human being. Rumford questioned Billy gruffly, satisfied himself that Billy really had been in Dresden. He asked Billy what it had been like, and Billy told him about the horses and the couple picnicking on the moon. The story ended this way. Billy and the doctors unharnessed the horses, but the horses wouldn't go anywhere. Their feet hurt too much. And then Russians came on motorcycles, and they arrested everybody but the horses. Two days after that, Billy was turned over to the Americans, who shipped him home on a very slow freighter called the Lucretia A. Mott. Lucretia A. Mott was a famous American suffragette. She was dead. So it goes. It had to be done, Rumford told Billy, speaking of the destruction of Dresden. I know, said Billy. That's war. I know. I'm not complaining. It must have been hell on the ground. It was, said Billy Pilgrim. Pity the men who had to do it. I do. You must have had mixed feelings there on the ground. It was all right, said Billy. Everything is all right, and everybody has to do exactly what he does. I learned that on Trophimador. Billy Pilgrim's daughter took him home later that day, put him to bed in his house, turned on the magic fingers. There was a practical nurse there. Billy wasn't supposed to work or even leave the house for a while, at least. He was under observation. But Billy sneaked out while the nurse wasn't watching, and he drove to New York City, where he hoped to appear on television. He was going to tell the world about the lessons of Trafamador. Billy Pilgrim checked into the Royalton Hotel on 44th Street in New York. He, by chance, was given a room which had once been the home of George Jean Nathan, the critic and editor. Nathan, according to the earthling concept of time, had died back in 1958. According to the Trophamadorian concept, of course, Nathan was still alive somewhere, and always would be. 
The room was small and simple, except that it was on the top floor, and had French doors which opened onto a terrace as large as the room. And beyond the parapet of the terrace was the airspace over 44th Street. Billy now leaned over that parapet, looked down at all the people moving hither and yon. They were jerky little scissors. They were a lot of fun. It was a chilly night, and Billy came indoors after a while, closed the French doors. Closing those doors reminded him of his honeymoon. There had been French doors on the Cape Ann love nest of his honeymoon. Still were. Always would be. Billy turned on his television set, clicking its channel selector around and around. He was looking for programs on which he might be allowed to appear. But it was too early in the evening for programs that allowed people with peculiar opinions to speak out. It was only a little after eight o'clock, so all the shows were about silliness or murder. So it goes. Billy left his room, went down the slow elevator, walked over to Times Square, looked into the window of a tawdry bookshop. In the window were hundreds of books about fucking and buggery and murder, and a street guide to New York, and a model of the Statue of Liberty with a thermometer on it. Also in the window, speckled with soot and fly shit, were four paperback novels by Billy's friend, Kilgore Trout. The news of the day, meanwhile, was being written in a ribbon of lights on a building to Billy's back. The window reflected the news. It was about power and sports and anger and death. So it goes. Billy went into the bookstore. A sign in there said that adults were only allowed in the back. There were peep shows in the back that showed movies of young women and men with no clothes on. It cost a quarter to look into a machine for one minute. There were still photographs of naked young people for sale back there, too. You could take these home. The stills were a lot more Trophamadorian than the movies, since you could look at them whenever you wanted to, and they wouldn't change. Twenty years in the future, those girls would still be young, would still be smiling or smoldering or simply looking stupid with their legs wide open. Some of them were eating lollipops or bananas. They would still be eating those. And the peckers of the young men would still be semi-erect, and their muscles would be bulging like cannonballs. But Billy Pilgrim wasn't beguiled by the back of the store. He was thrilled by the Kilgore Trout novels in the front. The titles were all new to him, or he thought they were. Now he opened one. It seemed all right for him to do that. Everybody else in the store was pawing things. The name of the book was The Big Board. He got a few paragraphs into it, and then he realized he had read it before, years ago in the veterans' hospital. It was about an earthling man and woman who were kidnapped by extraterrestrials. They were put on display in a zoo on a planet called Zircon 212. These fictitious people in the zoo had a big board supposedly showing stock market quotations and commodity prices along one wall of their habitat, and a news ticker and a telephone that was supposedly connected to a brokerage on Earth. The creatures on Zircon 212 told their captives that they had invested a million dollars for them back on Earth, and that it was up to the captives to manage it so that they would be fabulously wealthy when they were returned. The telephone and the big board and the ticker were all fakes, of course. They were simply stimulants to make the earthlings perform vividly for the crowds at the zoo, to make them jump up and down and cheer or gloat or sulk or to tear their hair, to be scared shitless or to feel as contented as babies in their mother's arms. The earthlings did very well on paper. That was part of the rigging, of course. And religion got mixed up in it, too. The news ticker reminded them that the President of the United States had declared National Prayer Week and that everybody should pray. The Earthlings had a bad week on the market before that. They had lost a small fortune in olive oil futures. So they gave praying a whirl. It worked. Olive oil went up. Another Kilgore Trap book there in the window was about a man who built a time machine so that he could go back and see Jesus. It worked, and he saw Jesus when Jesus was only twelve years old. Jesus was learning the carpentry trade from his father. Two Roman soldiers came into the shop with a mechanical drawing on papyrus of a device they wanted built by sunrise the next morning. It was a cross to be used in the execution of a rabble-rouser. Jesus and his father built it. They were glad to have the work, and the rabble-rouser was executed on it. So it goes. The bookstore was run by seeming quintuplets, by five short, bald men chewing unlit cigars that were sopping wet. They never smiled, and each one had a stool to perch on. 
They were making money running a paper and celluloid whorehouse. They didn't have hard-ons. Neither did Billy Pilgrim. Everybody else did. It was a ridiculous store, all about love and babies. The clerks occasionally told somebody to buy or get out, not just to look and look and paw and paw. Some of the people were looking at each other instead of the merchandise. A clerk came up to Billy and told him that the good stuff was in the back, that the books Billy were reading were window dressing. That ain't what you want, for Christ's sake, he told Billy. What you want's in the back. So Billy moved a little farther back, but not as far as the part for adults only. He moved because of absent-minded politeness, taking a trout book with him, the one about Jesus and the time machine. The time traveler in the book went back to Bible times to find out one thing in particular, whether or not Jesus had really died on the cross, or whether he had been taken down while still alive, whether he had really gone on living. The hero had a stethoscope along. Billy skipped to the end of the book, where the hero mingled with the people who were taking Jesus down from the cross. The time traveler was the first one up the ladder, dressed in clothes of the period, and he leaned close to Jesus so people couldn't see him use the stethoscope, and he listened. There wasn't a sound inside the emaciated chest cavity. The Son of God was dead as a doornail. So it goes. The time traveler, whose name was Lance Corwin, also got to measure the length of Jesus, but not to weigh him. Jesus was five feet and three and a half inches long. Another clerk came up to Billy and asked him if he was going to buy the book or not, and Billy said that he wanted to buy it, please. He had his back to a rack of paperback books about oral genital contacts from ancient Egypt to the present and so on, and the clerk supposed Billy was reading one of these. So he was startled when he saw what Billy's book was. He said, Jesus Christ, where did you find this thing? And so on. And he had to tell the other clerks about the pervert who wanted to buy the window dressing. The other clerks already knew about Billy. They had been watching him, too. The cash register where Billy waited for his change was near a bin of old girly magazines. Billy looked at one out of the corner of his eye, and he saw this question on its cover. What really became of Montana Wild Hack? So Billy read it. He knew where Montana Wild Hack really was, of course. She was back on Trofamador, taking care of the baby, but the magazine, which was called Midnight Pussycats, promised that she was wearing a cement overcoat under 30 fathoms of salt water in San Pedro Bay. So it goes. Billy wanted to laugh. The magazine, which was published for lonesome men to jerk off to, ran the story so it could print pictures taken from blue movies which Montana had made as a teenager. Billy did not look closely at these. They were grainy things, soot and chalk. They could have been anybody. Billy was again directed to the back of the store, and he went this time. A jaded sailor stepped away from a movie machine while the film was still running. Billy looked in, and there was Montana Wild Hack alone on a bed, peeling a banana. The picture clicked off. Billy did not want to see what happened next, and a clerk importuned him to come over and see some really hot stuff they kept under the counter for connoisseurs. Billy was mildly curious as to what could possibly have been kept hidden in such a place. The clerk leered and showed him. It was a photograph of a woman and a Shetland pony. They were attempting to have sexual intercourse between two Doric columns in front of velvet draperies which were fringed with deedly balls. Billy didn't get onto television in New York that night, but he did get onto a radio talk show. There was a radio station right next to Billy's hotel. He saw its call letters over the entrance of an office building, so he went in. He went up to the studio on automatic elevator, and there were other people up there waiting to go in. They were literary critics, and they thought Billy was one, too. They were going to discuss whether the novel was dead or not. So it goes. Billy took his seat with the others around a golden oak table with a microphone all his own. The master of ceremonies asked him his name and what paper he was from. Billy said he was from the Ilium Gazette. He was nervous and happy. If you're ever in Cody, Wyoming, he told himself, just ask for Wild Bob. Billy put his hand up at the very first part of the program, but he wasn't called on right away. Others got in ahead of him. One of them said that it would be a nice time to bury the novel now that a Virginian, 100 years after Appomattox, had written Uncle Tom's Cabin. Another one said that people couldn't read well enough anymore to turn print into exciting situations in their skulls, so that authors had to do what Norman Mailer did, which was perform in public what he had written. 
The master of ceremonies asked people to say what they thought of the function of the novel might be in modern society, and one critic said, to provide touches of color in rooms with all white walls. Another one said, to describe blowjobs artistically. Another one said, to teach wives of junior executives what to buy next and how to act in a French restaurant. And then Billy was allowed to speak. Off he went in that beautifully trained voice of his, telling about the flying saucers and Montana wild hack and so on. He was gently expelled from the studio during a commercial. He went back to his hotel room, put a quarter into the magic fingers machine connected to his bed, and he went to sleep. He time-traveled back to Trofamador. Time-traveling again? said Montana. It was artificial evening in the dome. She was breastfeeding their child. Hmm? said Billy. You've been time-traveling again. I can always tell. Um, where did you go this time? It wasn't the war. I can tell that, too. New York. The Big Apple. Hmm? That's what they used to call New York. Oh. You see any plays or movies? No. I walked around Times Square some, bought a book by Kilgore Trout. Lucky you. She did not share his enthusiasm for Kilgore Trout. Billy mentioned casually that he had seen part of a blue movie she had made. Her response was no less casual. It was Trofamadorian and guilt-free. Yes, she said, and I have heard about you in the war, about what a clown you were, and I have heard about the high school teacher who was shot. He made a blue movie with a firing squad. She moved the baby from one breast to the other because the moment was so structured that she had to do so. There was a silence. They're playing with the clocks again, said Montana, rising, preparing to put the baby in its crib. She meant that their keepers were making the electric clocks in the dome go fast, then slow, then fast again, and watching the little earthling family through peepholes. There was a silver chain around Montana Wildhack's neck. Hanging from it, between her breasts, was a locket containing a photograph of her alcoholic mother. A grainy thing, soot and chalk. It could have been anybody. Engraved on the outside of the locket were these words. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to always tell the difference. <laughs>